Sorry about that. That wasn't a story. It was a mistake. Oh, okay. I made a mistake. Okay. <laughs> so we're picking up our studies. We continue through the, the book of Acts. And as, as I've been looking ahead, this should work out very well to finish this up the Sunday before Palm Sunday. So I've been praying about what we're going to do after that because I need to start studying and looking ahead. And so so uh, just some things I've been reading <clears throat> Uh, it, from our uh, uh, Hebrew study and, and the Acts study, how they are, are intertwining, leading us kind of in a direction there. So I'll give you some more ideas on that later. But <clears throat> this morning we are in Acts chapter 23. And we're going to be covering, <coughs> excuse me, uh, pretty much full chapters uh, as we finish this on out. <coughs> so we'll be covering over some some scripture, pretty uh, large chunks of scripture. But as we saw in our last couple of lessons, Paul now has arrived at Jerusalem. Uh, and he's brought, he brought that, that offering from the churches that he'd started in those last two missionary journeys. And in the third missionary journey, they, they collected these offerings. And as we saw, as he brought those into the temple in, in the most innocent act of all uh, of going... <coughs> Excuse me, Joe, would you give me some water? <coughs> Get a tickle. In a most innocent act of, of all of going, taking these four men to the temple to uh, to fulfill their, their sacrifice, the, the Jews saw him and thought he had taken a Gentile into the temple. He hadn't, he hadn't done that at all. But this mob of Jews rushed him and they began beating him. They didn't have all the facts, which is usually the case with mobs. But the Roman commander saw what was happening and he, he, he saved Paul actually, protected him, took him out. Thought Paul was the one, thank you, who had caused all of this. So Paul asked to speak to the Jewish crowd. And he was, he was granted permission. And we know that, that he spoke to the commander in Greek but then he spoke to the crowd in Aramaic, so the commander didn't have any idea what he was saying. All the commander knew was that he said something that really upset them. And it, it was shocking as we, we went through that last time to see that all of Paul's speaking of his, his worshiping and his serving Jesus, it, talking about that, didn't bring a peep from the crowd. And that's what had caused all the problems before. But when he got to the part about taking the gospel to the Gentiles, the, the mob erupted. They, they just they said, as we saw back in chapter 21, uh, verse 22, uh, said, what, what is to be done? They will hear. I, I think that's the wrong, wrong verse. Um, oh, yeah, chapter 22, verse 22. They listened to him. The, the mob did up to this statement and then they raised their voice. When he mentioned the Gentiles, they raised their voice and said, away with such a fellow from the earth for he should not be allowed to live. And so they, they, they started rushing him and then in verse 30 we saw, but on the next day, wishing to know for certain why he'd been accused by the Jews, the, the commander released him and ordered the chief priests and the council to reassemble. He wanted to know. He didn't know what Paul said to them that, that stirred them up so much. So he wanted to know exactly what had been said and exactly what had happened. So that's where we are this morning. So let's let's look at this with, with prayer. Father, as we come into this, this continuing study, I pray, Lord, that you will open our hearts and our minds and that we will see how we must stand how you have brought us to this place at this time for a reason and how we must stand as Paul stood and how you used him. May you use us as well. Open our hearts to understand and give us courage that we may serve you in this time and in this place. We lift our prayer this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So, chapter 23. It's the next day after the uproar. And so this Roman commander, after thinking about this all night, decided he really wanted to know what was going on. After Paul's speech, he didn't know any more than, than he did to start with because he couldn't understand Aramaic. And so he brought Paul down and called the Sanhedrin together, which tells us 
how much power Rome actually had over the Jews. So he called the Sanhedrin together and he brought Paul before them. Now the Sanhedrin, for those of you who don't know, is, is like the Supreme Court of the Jews. There were Actually, our court system is, is based on the Judeo-Christian uh, way of doing things. There are smaller courts, lower courts, we might say, that take it to higher courts and higher courts, and then it eventually goes before the Sanhedrin, like our Supreme Court. But the commander called the Supreme Court together to start with, and he brought Paul before them. So likely this meeting took place somewhere near the Antonia Fortress where the, the Roman soldiers were stationed because they would have not been permitted in the temple where they would normally have met. So that's where we are as we begin chapter 23. But before we actually get into what was said, you need to know a little bit about who's there. Who, who is this Sanhedrin made up of? This is, this is just... This is not actually a trial. This is just more like a, a hearing. But the, the, the Sanhedrin was made up of three groups of people. There was the high priest and the chief priests. That would be the president of the Sanhedrin, the captain of the temple guard, all the former high priests and their sons. We saw in Acts chapter 4 that Peter and John were taken before the Sanhedrin. Stephen was taken before the Sanhedrin. But in the Old Testament, the high priest was descendants of Aaron. It was Aaron to Aaron's firstborn son to the firstborn son to the firstborn son. That's how the high priesthood was supposed to be conducted. However, in the, in the Roman times, it had become like I've called a political football. It was bought and sold to the highest bidder, and we saw how Caiaphas and his family, Annas and his family, Kept bribing the get bribing the Roman government, and so they stayed in control. But it, it would have been all of those and anyone who had ever been a high priest. Next was the elders. The elders were the heads of families and tribal heads of the priests, and and all, all of the um, elders of different groups of people, tribes of people. And then there were the scribes, these three groups, the, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. The scribes were known as lawyers, not how we think of lawyers today, but those who were experts in the Jewish law. Those who copied the scrolls were called the lawyers, the scribes. So these three groups of people fell into two sections, Pharisees and Sadducees. All the priests were Sadducees. All the scribes were Pharisees. The elders could have been of either. So that's who's made up. There were 70 members. That's who made up this Supreme Court, this Sanhedrin. So that's who was there when Paul was brought before them. So we begin with verse 1. It says, And Paul, looking intently at the council, said. So let, let's stop right there for a second. There are various reasons. Some say he, he looked intently. Others said he looked at them closely. There was a reason, there are various reasons in the commentaries why he looked intently. And the sense of the word is, is that he looked at each one of them in the eye. Looked around the room at each one of them in the eye. The tense of the word in indicates that. But, but why did he do that? Why did he take the time to do that before he started speaking? Well, some think he couldn't see very well. That's, that's a common, um, uh, thing that we, we think or we know about Paul that his eyesight was very poor. Others think, and, and I, this is what I had always thought, and then I finally read it in one of my Jewish commentaries, that he was looking to see who was there. It wasn't that he was being so bold as to, you know, it wasn't that he wasn't being afraid. He's looking at each one of them, but he's looking to see who's there because you got to remember his close connection with this, this group, the Sanhedrin. There are differences of opinion as to whether he actually was a member of the Sanhedrin at one time. I don't think he was, but he was closely connected with them. I think before his, he, before his uh, conversion experience, I think he was too young to have been a member, and then he, he was converted, of course, and, and was not a part. But, but, I think, but he had many close friends. I think he was looking, it's been 30 years since he had any connection with the Sanhedrin. He's looking to see who's still there. 
Are there still people there that he knew? Are, are there <coughs> children of the people there that he knew? Who is there? Or, or perhaps if maybe some of his old friends had now been a part of this group. He looked at them closely and he said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this date. Now you and I per look at perfectly good conscience and we, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I think back to my childhood and I'd start to do something and my mother would say, let your conscience be your guide. You know, you might not want to do that. But that's not what he's talking about here. What Paul what is saying here is that Paul is saying, I have lived my life by keeping the law of Moses. Perfectly good conscience means I have kept the law. William Barclay said there was a certain audacious recklessness to Paul's conduct. We normally he normally would say uh, he, he would address it more in a in a in a your honor type of manner. But he's putting brethren, he's putting himself on the same level of them. William Barclay said, goes on to say that he acted like a man who knew he was burning his boats. You know, I say he knew he was burning his bridges. He knew this is going to be his only shot to stand before the Sanhedrin. Normally, he was supposed to say rulers of the people and elders of Israel. But he didn't. He said, brethren, I'm on the same level with you. The charge uh, that the mob made against Paul was that he was teaching disobedience to the law. And Paul said, I'm not doing that. I have kept the law of Moses. And then he goes on to say, I have lived this perfectly good conscience. I've fulfilled my duty to God. And he's, he said, I have kept the law of Moses. But as soon as he said that, we see that the high priest had him struck in the mouth. Verses 2 through 5 are a little bit of a mystery. The high priest, Ananias, commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. And Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. And do you sit and try me according to the law and in violation of the law ordered me to be struck? We saw all the things about Jesus' trial that were illegal. It was illegal to strike someone who was on trial. And the high priest had, had that done. And when he was reprimanded, when that happened, Paul said he, did, he didn't know the high priest, that Ananias was the high priest, verses 4 and 5. He said, the bystander said, do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I didn't, I didn't know he was the high priest. Well, why, why wouldn't he know? Well, several reasons. If they were not meeting in the temple court, he wouldn't have had his priestly garments on. He was a different high priest than when Paul was there. He may not have known that that was the man who was the high priest. It's been years since he had been there. Third, maybe Paul, maybe he was behind Paul. He didn't know who gave the order. Maybe he was saying, I didn't know somebody as vile as this man could be the high priest. We, we don't really know why he said that. Was that he, he was saying, whatever the reason, he was saying he didn't know that Ananias was a high priest and he didn't offer any excuse. He admitted that he was wrong and he accepted responsibility. And then in verse 6, we see another of those incidences that, that Luke records. I, I love this about Luke's writing. There are so many instances throughout the book of Acts that if it had not been such a serious situation, it, was, it would be comical what had happened. We've seen so many of those. But in verse 6, we see... But perceiving that one part of, of the, the, the uh, council there were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. Now, when it says he perceived that one part was Sadducees and one part Pharisees, it doesn't mean that the light bulb came on and he suddenly, Oh, yeah. Now, he, he knew that, of course, but what he would have known was that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in, in life after death. They did not, they did not believe uh, in many things that the Pharisees did. And so Paul said, if Paul, what Paul had taught, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is central to our faith. That's what, that's what it's all about. If he had not 
resurrected, if he had not risen from the dead, our faith would be in vain. Paul wrote that many times. And so Paul cried out, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, and I am on trial for the hope and the resurrection of the dead. Well, that that just blew it all apart. And again, and he had to be rescued by the Roman troops. Again, verse 7, he said this, there arose a division and the assembly was divided. And, and verses 8 and 9 tell us about, about the differences of what they believe in that great uproar. And when all that was happening, verse 10, the commander had to come and rescue him once again out of that. He said he was afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them and he ordered the troops to go down and bring him away from them by force and bring him back to the barracks. So that night though, that night, verse 11, you think about Paul having been in this. What's taken place over the course of these couple of days. The mob grabbing him. The, the commander having to, to save him from that. Not knowing who he was. Suddenly finding out he's a Roman soldier. I can't beat the truth out of him. And then trying to get to the bottom of it only to find another uproar going on. So you got to put yourself in Paul's place. It's been through all of that. And so that night, lying on his bed thinking back over the previous day's activities, don't you know that Paul had to be questioning? Should I really have said to them what I said? Should I have said it in the way that I said it? Could I, should I have, I definitely could have been a little bit more diplomatic, but should I have been? Questioning, did I go about it in the right? Don't tell me you've never been through that. I know we all have. If you've done the right thing by coming to Jerusalem, I mean, what have we seen over these past few weeks? The Spirit told him, the Spirit testified to him that in, in every city that he went in, the closer he got to Jerusalem, bonds and afflictions awaited him. The saints at Tyre kept telling Paul, we've had these visions, we've had these dreams, it's not going to go well for you when you get there. Agabus prophesying to him very vividly, don't go there. You're going to be put in chains. And, but Paul was convinced that he must go on. He believed that the Holy Spirit was leading him on. That wasn't the question. The question was, you, you can be convinced that you're doing the right thing and still question if you're doing it the right way. And I, and I, and I just believe Paul was doing that that night on his bed. So how do we know that? How, why do I feel that way? Because of what happened next. And we've seen this many times throughout Acts. Every time that, it, that Paul appears to, to be a little bit uneasy, a, a little bit uncomfortable in what he's supposed, or even discouraged or afraid, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, comes to him and encourages him. I've said so many times, how can you encourage someone if they haven't first been discouraged to start with? You don't tell somebody, don't be afraid if there's not a chance of them being afraid. So we know God, we know Jesus came to him. That tells us that he was questioning these things. We've seen that many times before. Anytime he's uneasy about what he's supposed to do next, Jesus appears to him in a vision. When he was in Troas and he couldn't go this way or that way and ended up in Troas, he had a vision come across into Macedonia. When he was worn and discouraged in Corinth after he'd been through Athens, the Lord said, do not be afraid any longer. Well, what's that tell us? He had been afraid. Go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. Then in Paul's speech that he just gave in chapter 22, we learn about an incident that we don't have in Scripture where when Paul was in Jerusalem initially, after his conversion, Jesus told him to leave. Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony. And remember, Paul argued with him. Oh, surely, they knew what I was like and now they know what I should. Jesus says, get out of town. But this night... This night, as he lay there questioning, verse 11 continues, but on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, 
take courage. For as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause in Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. Rome. Can you imagine? I bet Paul sat straight up in his bed when he heard that. The very place that he had wanted to go for forever. He wrote the letter to the Romans when he was in Corinth, said, I'm, I'm going to come there after I go to Jerusalem. Well, he is, but he certainly didn't think he was going to go this way. He wanted to go to Rome. And Jesus said, you will be my witness in Rome. Like I said, this may not have been exactly how he thought he was going to get to Rome, but he would eventually go to Rome. But, but this is what I want us to look at from verse 11. It said, the Lord stood by him. Your translation may word that a little differently. But when I read that, it just it, it had, had this vision. The Lord stood by him. Yeah, he, he stood by him and spoke. That was in, in the sense of him being there. But just that phrase, the Lord stood by him. Don't you know that you can face anything when the Lord stands by you? A successful ministry or successful life isn't always the gauge of the Lord's approval. We always say, well, their ministry is so successful, they must be doing the Lord's will. Or somebody's in trouble and it's not going well, they must be going against God. Not necessarily. In Paul's case, he was facing this strife and this turmoil, but he was following the Lord's guidance. In times of uncertainty in our lives, what assurance it is to know that if, if we are His, the Lord will stand by us. Well, the rest of this chapter reads like a suspense novel, and I'm not going to take a, a lot of time with it, but you can see in verses 12 through 15 that, that this plot is formed. It's just like reading a novel. This plot is formed that included 40 people, and they, they took this vow, they made an oath. They were going to assassinate Paul. They were not going to eat or drink anything until Paul was dead. Which makes me wonder what happened to them after Paul escaped. Did they did they not eat or drink or did they in some way wiggle out of that? But but this plot just happened to be overheard by Paul's nephew. Paul's sister's son. I mean the, the, you you can't make this stuff up. I mean this what 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 a way for God to act. So we in verses uh, 16 through 22, we see that taking place. And this, this young man, this nephew goes to Paul. And Paul tells him, you, you've got to go to the commander. And so he tells, tells the one guarding him to take him to the commander. Because he has something to say to him. And in verse 19, I love this. This just this just such a human thing. And the commander took him by the hand. The, the, the boy had to have been very young. You know, if he'd been, you know, an adult, 20, 30 years old, the commander's not going to take him by the hand. It's a young boy. The commander took him by the hand, and he began to inquire of him, what is it you've come to tell me? And so the boy tells him the story, tells him what's going to, going to happen there. And, and so the commander let the young man go, verse 22, and said, don't tell anybody. That you, what you've told me. And so the commander sits about and he decides to get Paul out of there. Send him to Caesarea on the coast of the Mediterranean to Felix, who is the Roman governor. Verses uh, 23 through 35 is this, this whole story of going there. And I encourage you to read this. this fascinating story of how they do that. They leave about 9 o'clock at night. What's really quite comical about this is the letter. That Felix, that uh, that the centurion wrote to Felix the governor. We see that in verses twenty six through thirty. So he writes this, and he says, Claudius Lysias to the most excellent governor Felix, greetings. When this man was arrested by the Jews and was about to be slain by them, I came upon him with troops and I rescued him, and I knew that he was a Roman. No, that's not how it happened at all. Then he goes on, and I wanted to ascertain the charge. I wanted to find out, and so. I brought him down to the council and I found out all this. They were accusing him of questions about their law, but under no accusation deserving death or imprisonment. And when I was informed that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you. I mean, this guy's really building himself up in this. 
So he sends them, and the, ro- the, the soldiers took this. They, they took this letter, took Paul, and he tells how, how they went. They went halfway there, sent the horsemen back. They, they really had a huge contingency of soldiers. And then in verse 33, they come to Caesarea, and, the, and they, leak, they, they bring this letter. And, and Felix reads this letter. Um, he said when he had read it, verse 34, he asked Paul what province he was from. He was a Roman, soul, a Roman citizen. Whereabouts are you from? And Paul said he was from Cilicia. And, and Felix said, I will give you a hearing after your accusers arrive also giving orders for him to be kept in Herod's Praetorium. So he's down there. If you, if you pull out your map, you see where Caesarea on the coast is. That's, that's the headquarters for the Roman governor. And so they have him there. And Felix says, I'm going to wait until they come down and bring the charge here. But what, what's so interesting about this, I'd like to, to, to say a little bit about Paul's appearance in front of Felix. And we'll, we'll talk more about this in the weeks to come. But... In this letter, uh, this letter that was presented to Felix, Felix read the letter and, as we said, asked Paul, where are you from? Paul said, Cilicia. Now, it's true. That's where Paul was born and raised. And we know that how, how Paul was zealous for the law, how Paul persecuted the Christians, what Jerusalem meant to Paul. Don't you know that before he met Christ, Paul would have given anything to have been been born in Jerusalem. Don't you know that up until he met Christ, Paul cursed being born in Cilicia. Why couldn't I have been born in Jerusalem? Why? And he spent much of his life in Jerusalem studying, but he wanted how he would have loved to have been born in the most holy place in all the world. But on this day, how he must have thanked God for his Roman citizenship. Thanked God that God, as we spoke earlier, in his sovereignty had Paul born in Cilicia. How he must have been thanking God this day for his birthplace and Roman citizenship. He could not have done what he had done without those two things. So think about this. What in your past did you once hate that you now see how God has used it for his glory? Way back in our lesson on Paul's conversion, I said that Paul had a divine appointment on that road to Damascus. And I think that divine appointment continued this day. If Paul had not been born a Roman citizen, if he had not been born in such, if his parents had not been born Roman citizens, or they were Roman citizens whether they were born that way or purchased it, but that made Paul born into it. Remember he said to to the uh, uh, Roman centurion, or the the commander last time, the commander says, I bought my citizenship. Paul said, I was born into it. God in his sovereignty put all that in place even before Paul's birth. Continued to this day here in Caesarea. And it will continue all the way to Rome. And so when we studied that back in chapter 9, I asked a question then that I'll ask again. What if you believed that all you've been through in your life, all the pain, all the joys, all the disappointments, all the life experiences that you've had What if you believed that everything that's happened to you was sifted through the fingers of God? Everything has uniquely prepared you for service at this time in this place. Think about how you ended up here. Where you came from to be here. God had his hand in that. I asked the question then, does God choose people because they are uniquely prepared? Or have we been uniquely prepared because God has chosen us? God 
stands by his own. And he stands by you today. Whatever you're facing, wherever you are, whatever you're dealing with, if you are his, he will stand by you. So let's pray. Father, what a blessing it is to know that no matter what we do, no matter where we go, no matter